items in certain places so that it's easier for you to go and pick them. So those are kind of the operational decisions that you have. And a combination of these sizing and operational decisions influence performance and cost. And when you're talking about cost, you are worried about fixed cost and operating cost. So the startup costs include the cost of construction, the hardware, the devices that you buy, the cranes that you might buy, uh, and the software, the WMS and the WCS, the warehouse management and the control system that you may need. The operating cost, the machines, labor, utility, maintenance, and so on. Uh, and the performance metrics that you are interested in uh, are, are, are quite a bit. Uh, you see some overlap with what Keith talked about more that probably should be in here uh, like he talked about. But the common things are throughput capacity. How many storage and shared transactions can you handle in a day? Uh, what is the utilization of the devices? You don't want them to be too idle. Uh, how do you handle variations in SKUs uh, as the mix changes? Is the technology able to handle it? How do you handle variations in demand? So average versus peak. And we heard, talked about, you know, uh, back to school demand versus you know holiday season demand versus you know high high first shift demand versus low second shift demand and so on. Uh, so can your system handle some of those variations? So essentially, when we talk about design conceptualization, what we are really thinking about is trying to find out whether we can answer these questions or questions related to these decisions. So how does the system usually work? So usually, uh, when you have a customer, you know they have certain requirements. They have a demand profile. They have a certain number of SKUs. They have a certain kind of demand ratio, so average demand, peak demand. Uh, and they have some requirements in terms of the performance. They have a cycle time requirement. They say that you know we need to be able to retrieve loads or put away loads within a certain amount of time, you know, a few minutes for pulling up the loads for a particular trailer truck and so on. So that's the customer's perspective. Okay? From a design configurator's perspective, there are lots of things for him or her to choose. They have to decide on a technology. They have to look at the footage area that is available. And they have to make decisions on the number of storage locations, the number of tiers uh, of, of a system, the number of vehicles that they may have, and also some worry about the utilization of those vehicles and so on. So they need to design or decide the design parameter settings that considers all of those inputs and maximizes some objective that the customer might require. Okay? And so the decisions that they need to make are you know, several of these so these are some examples of decisions. What is the structure of it? How many tiers do I have? How many vehicles do I have? What's the utilization? What's the cycle time? What's the cost? What's the number of tiers? And so on. So these are the kinds of decisions that they are interested in. Okay? Now if, if you are an engineer or if you are in the operations research arena, this is a very nice problem. This is great because we have lots of decisions, some constraints, and some objective. Okay, so the naive person that doesn't know much about material handling uh, but knows about operations research would actually view this as an optimization problem. Okay, so I could write this as an optimization problem. I have an objective, I have constraints and I have decisions to make. Let's just go and solve it. Why are we making a big deal about this optimization problem? Well, the trouble is that this optimization problem can get very messy. So here's one example. And you can pose multiple optimization problems, but here's what makes this difficult. So if you want to minimize the expected cycle time for retrieval, retrieval of these loads, making sure that the throughput, which is a function of the number of devices or vehicles that we have, is at least a certain number. And we want to guarantee that the utilization of those devices is above a certain limit. And we have some constraints on the size of the depth to width ratio of this warehouse. And we want the number of tiers to be a certain, uh, below a certain limit because civil engineering constraints start to dictate, and so on. Well, we could write a constraint optimization problem, which has a lot of decision parameters uh, that are discrete. And so what we end up getting is a very complex, ugly, Nonlinear mixed integer programming problem. Okay, so it's 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 easy to formulate, but you probably won't go much further than just formulating that problem. Okay, the other issue is that some of these functions, like cycle time and throughput and utilization, and some of these, are also pretty complex relationships. Uh, have complex relationships with some of the decision parameters. So as a result, this conceptualization problem is is a hard problem. Yet. People in industry, people that need the systems, need to find an answer. 
So how, how does the process work in practice? So how do, how do people go about solving this complex optimization problem to get a design uh, that, that works for everybody? Well, so typically a customer explains the requirements to a designer, okay? And I put designer or designers. Sometimes you just go to one designer or you go to more than one designer and post the same requirements. The system designer <coughs> usually prepares a preliminary design and presents a proposal, okay? Now, given the complexity of, of this problem, preparing that preliminary design, which doesn't go into all of the details, itself takes four to six months, at least in many cases, okay? And it costs several thousand dollars. And that's where the, the choice for the customer really comes. You know, do I really want to go to one designer or multiple designers? Because it takes me four to six months to get an answer and it costs me several thousand dollars. And I want to make sure, you know, that you know, I don't blow away all my money in getting a preliminary design, okay? And then the customer, whatever design you get back, the customer provides some feedback, some alterations, maybe budgets have changed, maybe requirements have changed. And then eventually the system designer goes back and designs or prepares the final design, which is up more in detail, and also builds the system. Now, when you are doing this detailed design, very often the methodology of choice is simulation. People like to simulate it because I want to see how the system operates. And because of some of these complex relationships, it's hard to write a simple back of the analog equation that tells you how these parameters interact. So you simulate the system and, and you build the system. It takes about a year or two, and the system itself in many cases costs several million dollars for an automated system. So because of the time involved, very often people are not able to do an exhaustive search of the options available to them. People are unable to explore the design trade-offs that are available to them. And so the, the, what ends up happening is depending upon the, the designer that you go to or the technology choice that that designer is comfortable with, they create a design that works around that technology that they are comfortable with. And then you have to live with it because you don't know to do any better and it's extremely cost prohibitive to do anything more. And that's, that's what makes this field very, very uh, challenging or interesting. And, and so part of what I'm going to try to present to you is how people address these challenges and how we think as you know, academicians can actually build certain alternative analytical models that might address this gap or this need that is there in industry, okay? So what, what me and some of the other people that have written papers in those areas that I, I showed you believe is that you could use a combination of analytical models to develop certain thumb rules and trade-offs and understanding of how these decisions interact so that we can actually do a much better job of exploring the design space, okay? So the tools and the uh, techniques that I'm going to talk about over the next few minutes uh, essentially will allow us to explore these design space much more exhaustively rather than locking up. We can explore them much more exhaustively and in much less time. So if simulations take several months, uh, the tools that I'm going to talk about will take much less time and that allows us to actually search the space and make better, better decisions. Okay, so that's, that's, that's the idea of the remaining part of the presentation. Uh, and I'll also show you how those tools provide some good thumb rules or good decisions uh, or trade-offs, uh, under understanding of the trade-off while you are conceptualizing or designing some of these unit load systems. Okay, so that's, that's the idea of the rest of the presentation. So the rest of the presentation is essentially going to answer four key questions related to uh, the design conceptualization of ABSRS systems. So the first question, what is the effect of design parameters such as depth to width ratio multiple zones, vehicle assignment rules, cross-eye location, and dwell point policies on the performance. Okay, so there are a lot of these system sizing and operational decisions. So that's the first question. The second question is, what is the effect of vehicle interference or blocking in aisles and cross-eyes on system performance? The third one looks at different mechanisms for doing vertical transfer, whether it is conveyors or lift, and so on. And the last question is actually 
something that ties all of this together saying you know can we develop general scalable computationally efficient models that can allow us to rapidly evaluate different configurations or scenarios during the design phase. Okay, so that's, that's essentially uh, the, the idea. So progressively, I'm going to try and answer each one of these questions. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you some examples of the kinds of models we build and the kinds of understanding we get. So let's take the first question uh, and uh, say that, OK, what is the effect of design parameters, uh, such as depth width ratio, zones, assignment, and so on, on system performance? So let's understand a little bit more about how an ABSRS system actually works so that we can understand how these decisions ma matter. Okay, so here's a wireframe diagram of, of the system that I showed you in the video. So this is the lift, okay, uh, and there's a single lift that carries load up and down. These are individual tiers. The black stripes that you see here are the storage areas. The white caps between the black stripes are the aisles through which the vehicles move, carrying and bringing out the palletized loads. Uh, the white strip that is horizontal here is the cross aisle that actually allows the vehicle to move in the x direction and then enter the aisle or come out of the aisle and come to the left. Okay, so now if you're interested in the cycle time for a retrieval operation in this kind of a system, uh, the equation for cycle time actually is written here. Okay, now I'm not going to go into the details of it, but uh, what you see are two pieces, one bracketed in red and the other bracketed in blue. The one in blue is horizontal transfer. So let me tell you what a little bit, uh, what, what happens in the horizontal transfer. So if a retrieval transaction the system, it has to first make sure that there is a free vehicle that can be assigned to it. If all the vehicles are busy processing other transactions, then you, know, you don't have the vehicle assigned to it. So once you have a vehicle available, then the vehicle has to come to that location from which you want to retrieve the load. So it has to travel a little bit in the X, it has to travel a little bit in the Y, get to the location where that load is, and then pick up that load so there is a loading time. And then after it loads that pallet, it has to come back out of the aisle, go back into the cross aisle, so there's again some Y and X motion. And if it has to retrieve it, it has to probably come from here all the way down. So it retrieves it and then waits for the elevator then comes down on the elevator and then unloads that particular load. So those are, those are the kinds of things that are involved in retrieving a transaction. And something similar happens when you're storing a transaction. Okay, clearly, you know, you're not sure you're going to get a vehicle when you need it. It depends on how busy the vehicles are. Okay, you're not sure you're going to get the lift when you want to come down or go up because you're not sure how busy that is. And when the vehicles are coming along the cross aisle, that's a shared area. All vehicles may be using the cross aisle. So there may be traffic, there may be congestion. You will have to avoid some of those. And, and so you need to try to quantify and evaluate how those things happen as well. Okay? So our first idea is, well, it looks pretty complicated. So let's try to address this in pieces. So the first piece of how I'm going to look at conceptualization is to just look at a single tier. I'm not going to worry about the vertical aspect. I'm just going to take one tier out of it and leave the lift aside and just look at the operations within a tier and find out some of these trade-offs within a tier. Okay? And, and the idea is that if I have a good understanding of what happens within a tier, I can use a model of a tier to piece together how a multi-tier system would work. Okay? And that, that's the idea of, of this process. <coughs> Okay, so, so let's look at how things happen in a single tier. So here's the top view of a single tier. So the gray bars are the storage retrieval locations. The blank white is the aisle, and this is the cross aisle. So I'll show you how a, a retrieval uh, request might happen. So you have the blue dot is a retrieval location. So here is a retrieval location. Here's an idle vehicle. So if this idle vehicle is assigned to retrieve that vehicle, it could come back into the cross aisle, go into this aisle, 